Today, I wanna to talk about something that a lot of people have asked for. This is by far the most requested comparison that I've seen. The M2 chip versus the M1 Pro. And specifically, I do also want to talk about the differences between comparing the full M1 Pro and the double bend 8 plus 14 core M1 Pro to the M2. There's a lot to talk about here in terms of battery, fan noise, thermals, as well as the packages that these chips come in. So make sure to leave a like down below, get subscribed, and let's get into it. Why, hello there. It is I, Fancy Luke, and don't we all love when technology makes things easier for us? Well, except for when it doesn't. Oh, this is what does that mean? But the point is, it would be great to let technology take a load off. Except that right now, a lot of people are worried about high inflation eating into their savings and a market that's already down 17% this year so far. In a situation like we're facing today, financial advisors are recommending two main things. Number one, diversify your assets, and number two, invest in things with low volatility. Fortunately, technology can help, and today's video sponsor, Masterworks, has cracked the case. Masterworks can let you access something that until now was limited to the ultra-rich. I'm talking about contemporary art. Not only is it an inflation hedge and a diversifier, it's also got extremely low volatility and low correlation with the stock market. And now Masterworks lets regular fancy people like you or I access this asset class. So if you want to skip the wait list and join over 400,000 fancy Masterworks investors, check out the link in the description below to get started today. And now let's get back to the video. All right, so in my last video, I didn't wanna to make too many judgments on the MacBook Pro package that the M2 chip is in now because I wanted to get just a look at the chip, nothing else. And the fact that Apple didn't change anything was really good for that because it meant we had a perfect comparison. But now things are a little bit different because we're no longer comparing just chips. When you're talking about an M2 MacBook Pro, and a 14 inch MacBook Pro, you simply cannot ignore the fact that the 14 inch MacBook Pro is a phenomenal new chassis and this thing is basically from 2016. But we will come back to that because I do want to take a moment and just look at performance because a lot of people when the M2 chip came out started wondering, hey, this 20% extra CPU performance, this 35% extra GPU performance, is that going to mean that the M2 chip is getting really close in performance to the M1 Pro such that you could save a lot of money by buying this or a MacBook Air instead? So let's just dive right in with some numbers. So starting with a classic Geekbench 5 in the multi-core test, the M2 chip comes in at 8914, which is just a thousand points behind the 14 inch with the double bend processor. We see similar results over in Cinebench R23. 8706 on the M2 is very close to 9579 on the 8 plus 14. Now, the 10 core M1 Pro does pull out a pretty big lead here. It's about 41% faster than the M2. We see this again in V-Ray. The M2 chip scores 5442, which is not very far behind the 6019 of the base model 14 inch, but it is pretty significantly behind the full fat M1 Pro. And again here in Novabench, it's the same story. A much larger gap exists between the base model 14 inch and the higher spec 14 inch than between the M2 and the M1 Pro. However, things aren't like that across the board. While the M2's CPU is pretty close to the M1 Pro, the same is not necessarily true of the graphics. And we can see that pretty clearly in 3D Mark Wildlife Extreme, 
we get 6764 on the M2, which is a pretty decent gap between the 9189 of the base model, and that is in turn pretty close to the 16 core GPU, which of course only has two extra cores. We see this again in GFX Bench, in Aztec high tier, 109 for the M2 compared to 130 for the base model. We see 553 compared to 817 in Manhattan. And in T-Rex, we see 933 compared to 1458. It's really interesting because the M2 chip's biggest accomplishment was making the GPU a very noticeable increase over the previous M1 chip. But when you compare it to the M1 Pro, it honestly doesn't seem all that impressive because we are still at that four GPU core deficit. But what does that all mean for battery life? Well, as we know, the MacBook Pro with the M2 chip is rated for 20 hours, whereas the 14 inch is rated for 18. However, it's not quite that simple because as I found out when reviewing the 14 inch MacBook Pro, the battery life is going to depend on which version you got. So I saw the best battery life in the base model, and then this M1 Pro was pretty much right in the middle, and the M1 Max, I tested a 24 core one, had the worst battery life. So to get an idea of what you should expect, I ran a CPU test for just 20 minutes, just to get an idea of how different things could be over such a short amount of time. And honestly, I was pretty surprised. The M2 chip used 10% of its battery, but the M1 Pro used 15. And so what that shows us is, as you might expect, having more of the CPU cores is going to have an impact on battery life. And even though the battery on the M1 Pro is larger, it's going to need to be in order to fuel the chip. So the M2 is still the place to go if battery life and efficiency are the name of the game. But in addition to battery life, we also have to talk about thermals because I've expressed my frustration with the way Apple handles their fan curve on the 14 inch MacBook Pro. Essentially what they love to do is let the CPU cores get well up into the 90s before they start kicking in the fan. And even then, they will keep the CPU at like 95 so the fan can be quiet. I'm not a huge fan of that. Now, you could argue that Apple knows better than me, that they are comfortable intentionally allowing their CPUs to run that hot. And the M2 does actually fall into a pretty similar trap. Now, TG Pro, which is a great piece of software that allows you to monitor fan speeds and temperatures, has not yet been updated for the M2 chip, but the behavior is much the same as on the M1, where Apple also lets the chip get really hot before it kicks the fans in. The problem is the M2 chip, as we saw in yesterday's video, does actually produce a little bit more heat and thus this fan kicks in a lot more often than on the 14 inch. So what you've got is a pretty weird trade-off where the M2 is a more efficient chip than the M1 Pro, but the fan noise on the M2 is much more frequent than on the M1 Pro. But at the same time, the 14 inch is way more expensive. As spec, this one is $2,500, which is almost twice what the 13 inch costs. So do you get twice the performance? Well, in some real world tests, I found that that wasn't necessarily the case. Well, in Final Cut Pro, I did a 10 minute 4K 60 FPS ProRes render, and this yielded some pretty interesting results. It took about eight and a half minutes for the M2 MacBook Pro to render out a timeline, whereas on the 14 inch MacBook Pro, the base model can do it in less than four, and the 14 inch with the 10 core CPU and the 16 core GPU saves another 20 seconds off that time. And it got worse in the export where the M2 chip took about 11 and a half minutes compared to under two minutes on the 14 inch with the full fat CPU. The differences weren't as big, however, in Blender. It took 138 seconds for the M2 compared to just 100 seconds on the M1 Pro. 
that's certainly not twice as fast for twice the price. And we saw the same thing over in the classroom render. It took 259 seconds for the M2 compared to 201 on the 14 inch with the 16 core GPU. However, switching over to Octane, which promises excellent Apple Silicon optimization, it took 21 minutes and seven seconds on the M2 and just 13 minutes and 30 seconds on the 14 inch. So what we see here is depending on the optimization and what part of your system is going to be stressed, the 14 inch MacBook Pro can be a massive increase in speed. But in other cases, it's definitely not twice as fast for twice the price. So I guess what it comes down to is what you deem to be worth it. So as mentioned, this is half the price of this. That's a big difference, right? However, you do get a lot when you go up to the 14 inch, aside from just performance. There's screen size, there's design, there's ports, there's the speakers, the microphones, the webcam, the mini LED, the ProMotion. This is an objectively superior laptop in every single way, but you would want it to be for many hundred dollars more. If you spec the RAM and storage on the 13 inch to match the 14 inch, then this would be $1899 and this would be $2499. So if we break it down, you pay an extra $600 to jump to the 14 inch. And for that, you get all of those features as mentioned. I mean, this display alone is worth half of that upgrade. So it's it's weird, right? This is a very weird generation of Apple Silicon. In, in one way, um, I'm glad that the M2 is a decent upgrade, right? 18% better CPU isn't really groundbreaking. 35% better GPU is nice, but really what makes the Apple Silicon products that are coming out now exciting is not the performance gain going from M1 to M2, it's the generation gain going from an M1 MacBook Air to an M2 MacBook Air. So if you're talking about a chip upgrade without a design upgrade, to me, that's a little pointless. And for that reason, I don't think you should buy this thing. I think you should just go ahead and get a 14 inch MacBook Pro. Let me know down in the comments below if you agree with my analysis. Is the 14 inch better value than the 13 inch? Let me know down below. And as usual, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next video.